Hey, everybody. Welcome. Glad you are here. Welcome to the first ever direct from the cellar Napa Valley Library Wine Auction. My name is Doug Schaefer of Schaefer Vineyards. I'm on the board of directors of the Napa Valley Vintners, representing over 500 wineries here in our beautiful valley. We, my neighbors and I, have done a great job collecting some fantastic library wines from our sellers. They're, these lots are great. You need to check out the lots for this auction. Go to napa.wine, register, and start bidding. We have partnered with a great outfit, Zaki's Auction House. They are running this thing for us, and it's, they've done a great job. Bidding started today. And it's going to go for nine days, ending on Saturday, February 20th, 3 o'clock p.m. live stream, 3 p.m. California time to finish up, finish up the, the auction. So mark that on your calendar and start bidding now. All the proceeds from this auction go to promoting, protecting, and enhancing the Napa Valley. Now, to do this right, we partnered with another good friend of ours, Antonio Galoni. Uh, to do a series of in-depth winemaking sessions with some great winemakers. Some are new to you, some are familiar faces. It, he's got a great series lined up, five different sessions. Antonio Galoni, founder and CEO of Venice, one of the top wine publications around. He's the lead critic for California, Italy, Champagne, and Bordeaux. He and his team have created some really cool vineyard maps. You've got to see these things of different California sub-Appalachian vineyard growing areas. Got to check those out. Prior to Venice, Antonio was the lead critic with the Robert Parker's Wine Advocate. I'm very familiar, we're all familiar with that. And he's got an MBA from MIT Sloan School of Music. He's a Berkeley trained musician. When he's not uh, tasting wine, he's hanging with family, working out, and shredding the guitar. So, Mr. Antonio Galoni, I'm going to hand it over to you. Take it away, my friend. Doug, thank you so much. I don't know if I can live up to that introduction, but I'm going to try. <laughs> Welcome to everybody um, dialed into the Zoom call. We've got a couple hundred people already on, on this call. Boy, you are in for a treat. This is going to be an amazing session. It's the first of the Napa Valley sessions starting today with three young winemakers. Uh, I was joking before, uh, years ago when I would be asked to do these panels, I was always the youngest person, now I'm the oldest person, but um, this is gonna be really fun. We've got three fantastic guests uh, and the series will continue tomorrow with a look at Oakville. Then we've got a session on Rutherford. We've got a session on the cooler microclimates of Napa Valley, meaning uh, Stag's Leap and Point South, so Coombsville, et cetera. And um, then we'll wrap up with a session that looks at, the, at grapes out, uh, other than Cabernet Sauvignon. So I'm going to give a second for our, um, our panelists to turn on their video and their audio and um, introduce the, the group. It's, um, they're going to be fantastic. While they do that, I'm going to encourage you to grab a glass of wine, uh, open something, settle in. This is going to be a fantastic conversation. If you have questions, put them into the Q&A. And uh, we'll weave them into the conversation. Of course, the, uh, the goal is to have, you know, really interactive conversation. This is a real treat. I mean, I, I only get to spend time with these guys when I'm tasting the wine and I've always got this schedule. And, and this is really going to be fun to just sit down and, and have a chat um, with each of our three winemakers. Um, I asked them each to, to, to talk about two vintages, um, an older vintage and a more current vintage. Uh, we're going to talk about the auction lots that they've prepared, and then we're going to get into, into some Q&A. So let me introduce our, our three panelists, uh, starting with Corey Emting. So Corey, you're like a native Napa Valley person, St. Helena boy, um, joined Harlan Estate in 2001, which means 20 years. I hope you're planning something really special uh, for this year. <laughs> lots of large formats, I think, are going to be bottled, no? Exactly. <laughs> So it's, uh, it's a pleasure to, to have you on this panel. We've got two beautiful vintages of yours. We'll get into them in a second. Uh, and so this is Western Oakville where you are. And then I thought it would be fun to go over to the other side of town, Eastern Oakville and uh, the Dalla Valley with Maya Dalla Valley. Maya, I've known you forever too, it seems like. Um, you've worked all over the world, Chateau Latour or Nalaya, incredible background. Um, you've been working alongside your mom for a number of years, but this year you were formally appointed winemaker of your family's estate. So 
congratulations. I've got to imagine that's a really great feeling. Uh, it must be amazing. So thanks for being here. Congrats. Thank you. And then we're going to go over to, to the another mountain area um, with Brian Estate and KK Carruthers. KK, I don't remember the first year I met you, but it was a long time ago. Um, Maybe 14? Yeah, Some, 14 we'll around so. then. Yeah, seven years ago. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. you had a stint at Bryan Estate for a number of years. It's interesting, you and Maya both went to Cornell, so I don't know if this like, seems to be uh, a place <laughs> that breeds talent. Uh, pretty good school. No, I'm just kidding. I could have never gotten in, that's for sure. Um, then, uh, but I met you in 2014, you were assistant winemaker, then you went over to Adamus for a number of years as a winemaker, like a, a short stint, then you came back. So you've actually, your arc of experience with Bryant is, is pretty long, uh, given, you know, with just a little short interruption, but uh, you came back just in time for the 18 harvest, just in <laughs> time, which we're going to talk just about in a bit. So um, our three panelists, uh, welcome. Thanks for being here, Corey, Maya, KK. This is going to be great. So Corey, I'm going to start with you just because, um, and again, I just encourage everybody to, to, to pop, to, to, to throw your questions in the, into the Q&A and make this really interactive. But you have two vintages here. So, you know, we talked about one older vintage that's an inspiration and then one current vintage. You chose 1993, which I'm sad to say I'm old enough to remember when this wine came out because I sold this wine in Boston restaurants. Uh, so I remember this wine when it was first released tasted it a few other times, including at a, a wonderful tasting we did with the whole Harlan family in Naples a few years ago. But what was it about the 1993? Why did you pick this vintage? What does it mean to you? Yeah, it's definitely a good question. I, I think, you know, there's a lot of, a lot of the early 90s wines were a, a huge inspiration for me when I started here. And I think 1993 is an interesting one because it was definitely one where, you know, talking to Bob Levy, I always saw him light up because it was one that was extremely challenging for him and uh, kind of thinking about the things that he went through um, from kind of the picking decisions all the way through. Um, he definitely interpreted it in a, in a really different way than I'd heard anyone else do before. So I think on the, you know, as my mentor, it was an inspiration to hear him talk about it and light up. But also, I think it was a wine that's interesting, kind of like having been here for 20 years in the early years when we did verticals, it wasn't the one that we gravitated towards. But as, as time went on, it really became this thing that we all started to really highlight more and more. And today, I think we all generally accept that you know, it's one of the great wines from the early days. And so it's, it begs the question of you know, the human element uh, element evolving, how much of it was us evolving over time and how much of it was the wine itself evolving. So I've always found it to be a fun wine in that sense. <clears throat> it's, and it's held up beautifully, as you mentioned. I mean, it's just beautiful right now. Yeah. No, I like the story, just to give Bob a little bit of like airtime, he, he had kind of anticipated, we had like big rainfall uh, that year. And so a lot of vigor and he was trying to patiently wait to harvest, but he still felt like the tannins weren't quite at the level that he felt comfortable with. So he did uh, something I'd never heard of before, which is a reverse senye. He took the grapes when they came in, he pressed them, put the juice into the tank and he kept the grapes out. So he reduced the amount of grapes in the tank to be able to make something a little bit more fluid and harmonious. Um, and I think he accomplished that, <laughs> but it's, I was just, when he said it to me the first time as a young intern, I, I just couldn't believe he was actually serious about it. <clears throat> That's more detail than I usually get during a visit. <laughs> <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thanks. That's great. So then, so that's the 93 and, and then tell, take us through the arc that, um, and why you chose 2016. Obviously this is an important Napa Valley vintage, but is what's, wh why 16 you could have chosen um, you know, obviously quite a few vintages, <laughs> needless to say. So was it about 16 that spoke to you for this tasting? I mean, I think it's it's our most current release. Uh, so I, I think in a sense, it kind of bridges kind of the early days and, and uh, dealing with these kind of younger vines and really Bob trying to understand what this place uh, had to say and trying to work with it. And as we get to 16, we, you know, we now really have three generations working on the property. Um, you know, I'm kind of the second phase of that, but there are kind of younger members of the team now. And I think the 16 represents kind of that synergy. It's almost like having, you know, 
you know, grandpa, father, children, and there's a lot of good kind of back and forth that has evolved from that. But more than anything, I think there's kind of a deeper understanding of what this place has to say. And 16 is fun because you've got this great acidity, you've got freshness, it's vivid, yet it's young and youthful and, and it's got plenty of life ahead of it. So I thought it was yeah. to kind of connect, connect the points. It's beautiful. I mean, one of the things I think people may not know about Harlan Estate is that you have an incredible collection of old heritage clones planted in your property that you could not probably replicate today. And, and that's probably a lot of what, I mean, obviously the site is incredible, but tell us a little bit about some of those clones because I think it's one of the things that makes Harlan, Harlan Estate a really unique property. Yeah, I think at that at that point, as we started to, you know, Bob started to plant the vineyards, we're really looking for things that um, were unique to Napa Valley and um, not looking at clones as much as kind of field selections of things that had uh, kind of performed at a level. So we tried a lot of things from, you know, old Inglenook to, you know, Heights Martha's, which was next door, um, kind of smattering of other things uh, for the initial plantings. And as we've kind of continued, we've really tried to select from those uh, those selections and keep them going, keep them alive and vibrant, so. So it's really cool. I've been lucky to taste some of those wines from the barrel like that isolated, it's it's fascinating education. Well, that's great. I think it'd be fun to take it, to go across town to the other side of Oakville, to Maya Dalavala's place, which I confess I drive up there even when I'm not supposed to, because it's beautiful. <laughs> and sometimes the neighbors pull me over and they're angry, but you know, it's a place of arresting beauty. It has that impact on you. You just want to be there and to like breathe the air and to look at the views. So what is it about your part of Oakville you think that is unique as opposed to where Corey is on the Western edge? Well, I mean, first you can just look at the landscape and tell immediately there's a huge difference um, in climate because on you know on the western side of the Mayakamas it's very heavily forested there's a lot more moisture that passes through and then by the time that you get over to our side to the east side you have you know more chaparral um oak and it's a little bit more barren let's say so it's a, it's a drier spot obviously we get a lot more of the afternoon sun coming over there's a lot of sunlight on this side but we also get a direct hit from the San Pablo Bay of this nice cool marine breeze. So it's uh it's it's fun. Like I love tasting wines from the west side of Oakville and, and, and seeing you know the vineyards there and tasting those wines because it's it's such a contrast, but really like it's just a stone's throw away. So it's really fun to be part of such a great ABA. Yeah, we'll get into that in more detail tomorrow for, for all of our viewers watching. Uh, but obviously I want to get to your wines. Um, you have two beautiful wines that you that we're going to talk about. The first is this wine. I mean, it must be really cool to have a wine named after you. you yeah, with my name yeah. and my initials. You have two. <laughs> so yeah. this wine, MDV, this is the second vintage, well, actually the third vintage produced but in a way. But tell us about this wine and what's special about it. So this wine um, originally... Well, it was conceived by the idea was conceived by my my mother she had done a special auction lot for auction at the valley in in for the 99 vintage and had bottled um single five cases of maya's cabernet sauvignon which is the the best block of cabernet on our vineyard that is the base for maya and then had kind of forgotten about it and then had over time she we have you know some great friends who also love wine and they had tasted so many vintages of our wines at that point my mom was like just happened to come across these bottles and she's like oh I totally forgot about this wine so we opened it and they I mean it was just showing amazing I mean Antonio you've had the chase, chance to taste it as well it's just stunning and it's completely different from Maya because Maya always is blended with a high percentage of Cab Franc so to see it stand on its own and to see the capability of the wine as a singular Cabernet Sauvignon, my mom decided to bring that into the fold of our wines. And so we started MDV. And so 13 was the first um, vintage that we, we made 
of that wine. And then I've done 16 and 18. So we do in years that we consider to be really top quality. Yeah, for some reason, I thought it was 10. I got confused. Um, you know, in 2014, your mom posted me for a big vertical of, of, of Maya. Mm -hmm. and, and there was this wine in it. And I was blown away by this wine. This is the wine you're talking about, the 1999 yeah. charity wine, Cabernet Sauvignon. And so I did something that I never do, which is I asked your mom if I could take that bottle. I wanted to taste it over a couple of days. And, and I forgot. And, and I stupid. So I take, we had tasted it. We did this vertical and, you know, all the way back to the beginning. And, okay. and then I took this wine. I tasted it when I got back to my hotel. And then I forgot about it for literally like two days, which I'm embarrassed to say, but it's true. And afterwards, when I, when I noticed that, that I hadn't tasted it for two days, I felt like such an idiot. I'm like, how could you let this wine sit there for two days without tasting it? And then I tasted it after two days and it was like extraordinary. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, well, maybe that wasn't so bad. So, <laughs> so that was when I, you know, I was like, wow, um, that was that wine. And I remember it. So. Yeah, and you're lucky. I mean, that we only have, you know, one case of it. So it's really down to the last few bottles. But we've, over time, have kind of taken a bottle here and there to see how it ages. And it's just incredible how different it is, but still how, you know, powerful and structured that it is um, on its own. And so is that, is it specific blocks or might it vary from your year? It's about five barrels, right? Five or six barrels? So it's just, we take uh, five barrels and then bottle, five bo barrels of Maya's Cabernet Sauvignon and then bottle it as MDV. So it's really a pure expression of that particular block. Okay. Why it makes it, and it shows, you know, what makes it so definitive and, and special and unique from all the other parcels on our, on our property. Yeah, so, I mean, that's, it's beautiful. You know, it's funny, I, I mean, I've always loved 2013 vintage. I opened this wine a couple hours ago. It was so closed and now it's just, yeah, really beautiful. Uh, and then you also chose this wine, which is, you know, probably your most famous wine, but for a number of reasons, one of the things that your parents really believed in was Cabernet Franc, right. uh, which is now super trendy, but back then it was not so much. And this wine has always had a significant portion of Cabernet Franc, which is its signature. So tell us about, about 18 Maya. So 18 Maya, um, so this was the second year that I was back at the property and 17 was definitely a whirlwind of a year to start off on. Um, so 18 in comparison was a bit of a magical growing season, if you will. I mean, there was no extreme heat events. There was no extreme, you know, weather, weather in general, it was just pretty pristine throughout the whole season. So you really were, you were really able to focus on very precise farming and everything we wanted to do like went according to plan, which rarely ever happens. So that includes, you know, harvest time, we could pick down to the minutia of when we wanted to pick. So that's pretty rare to have that opportunity. Um, so it was uh, just a great vintage to work through and then um, just working on the blends together and just really coming through as a team, it's uh, a special vintage for, for us. And I think the wines have, I mean, they're incredibly balanced. They have the power, but they also have freshness. They have, you know, great components for a wine that's going to live for, for a long time. Yeah, so when does the blending happen for, for Maya? So it typically happens after the first year of aging. So this is the time of year that we're typically blending and then we'll rack would do the pre blends now. And then in a few months, we'll try to see if we can add anything to perfect or um, make little tiny changes to the blend and then we'll bottle in July. So this is the time of, we like, we like to let things sit for a year separately. So just to see through, you know, any changes we made in the farming or in each block and to see the full potential of each um, block before we decide to blend it. Great. Um, before we move over to, to KK, there's a question for you that I think would be great to answer now, um, which is you have a new wine that you're doing this year. 
the DVO. And one of the questions is uh, if you could just speak briefly a little bit about that project. Okay, yes. Um, so it's funny because it's a project I've been working on now for six years. So it's in, it's not new for me, but yes, now it's new for, for everyone else. But uh, this was originally, this is a collaboration between Ornalaya and Dalavale. So we've always had a, a good friendship with Ornalaya and I had the opportunity to do an internship there in 2013 where I worked closely with Axel Heinz who then eventually helped me also with my thesis when I was at Bordeaux Science Agro, which is the same university that he went to as well. So we always kept a good um, connection. And then, so they approached us about doing a project together, you know, starting from friendship and moving towards making wine together, which is a big step. But um, after thinking about it, we decided they would be a great partnership and great people to work with and so we started making wine um, in 17, actually, and we bottled about 200 cases. Um, it's a Cabernet Sauvignon with, of course, a little touch of Cap Franc because we both love, work with Cap Franc. We both love Cap Franc, so it just felt right to add it to the blend. But it's from selected sites in uh, Oakville, Mount Beater, and Coombsville. So we were aiming for cooler sites to make a wine that reflects both of our philosophies of winemaking with us, of making a wine with some restraint. So that is that is the project and 2018 will be released um, later this year. Yeah, no, I think that's really cool. The reason I asked you is because obviously I know you've been working on it for a number of years. Yeah. And these projects, they don't just happen one, you know, from year from year to year. Yours took six years. Uh, Bill Harlan, Bill Harlan bottled seven bottles, seven vintages of Harlan Estate before he showed that wine to my my friend and my former boss, Bob Parker. So, I mean, these things take, they have long gestation periods. It's not like a, something just happens from one day to the next. So thanks for that super eloquent answer. Um, I think it'd be fun to bring in KK Carruthers from Bryan Estate um, to join. You know, I, Bryan Estate is another place that I, I just love going to. Like every time I go there, I just want to just sit there and like, look at the view. <laughs> it's so spectacular. Um, you know, so you've got your hillside vineyard, Lake Hennessy, um, down at the bottom. You've also picked, I think, some, you know, vintages that are from very different eras. So the first, one of the wines that you chose is this, the 1995, which I, I've actually, I don't think I've ever tasted this wine. So I'm curious why you chose this wine and how it inspired you. Well, I've actually only had the 95 twice before. We have very few bottles of it. and. I think the initial prompt was pick a, a wine from historic vintage that inspires you. So yeah. I yeah. went, my brain went to the Helen Turley era and Brian's first vintage was 92. So the 95 is the, the fourth vintage. And, you know, you can talk about the growing season and technical winemaking, but it was really just the, the Helen Turley mindset that I always found was, Oh, there's our vineyard. I'm, I'm with you, Antonio. I always love the the vista. It just it never grows old, and I think it just really instills a lot of reverence that we have for what we do and and where we get to work every day. And it just is really inspiring in that way. Yeah, for sure. But um, let's see, Helen Turley. She's just I've never met her or talked to her before, but just what I've heard, she's just headstrong and brilliant and just this extraordinary woman. And so I was really vacillating between the 96 and the 97 and the 95, but just, I figured you've tried the 96 and the 97 before. And I was just really attracted to do the 95. The, I tasted it for the first time in 2014. And then I tasted it this year. Bettina's very generously let me open a bottle to have with you as well. But just those early years and what Helen Turley represented and just the, um, it's not no cutting corners, just working really hard, just, just that sort of ethos. And that's something that I sort of inspire to. It's not cutting threads, but just doing whatever it takes. So. Yeah. I think what's really fascinating about this era is, I mean, it's easy now to taste the wines and you know, to pick them apart or to be critical or whatever. But these were super innovative wines at the time. And they represented a, like an incredible focus on quality for all three properties that was not common 
And today there's just a proliferation of, of super high quality wines built on this foundation, you know, because you needed these first. But here you're going back to the early days of, you know, what Nap, what present day Napa Valley um, would have been, was like, you know, and um, it's just really great to taste this wine because it's, it's aged beautifully. It's still very fresh, has incredible mm -hmm. fruit presence. So um, obviously made in a pretty lush style, um, but it's, it's very cool. Um, so let's see. Um, so that's, that's 95, which again, thanks. It's not a, it's a vintage I don't think I've ever tasted before. And you're very right about 96 and 97. So <laughs> you, know, you know me really well. Just, uh, and then this is your 18. And so for people, right. for people who are watching, this is what like samples often look like when you get, you know, them shipped. like if you, if I could show you my, my house here, well, you wouldn't believe it, but there's like <laughs> wines everywhere, but a lot of them look like this. This is, you know, a wine with like sort of a technical label. And uh, this is, this is your 18 wine from the, from the, from the Bryant Vineyard on Pritchard Hill, which is the vineyard that we just saw. And uh, this is, I don't know, this is, this is your current release or your upcoming release. Right. We just released it. And in fact, since we, we have our own bottling line and we bottle in house, we bottle into shiners, hence the, the label on there. And here's the, we, we've just finished labeling. So we hand label, we put the proof tags on, got some blisters to prove it, but yeah, it just, it made sense to do an 18. It's our, our current release. We just released it a couple of weeks ago, in fact. And yeah, to Maya's point, it was a great growing season. It was really even. We had these wonderful picking windows, which for my first year back here, I really appreciated not having mother nature influencing any picking decisions that we have. For those who don't know, we have a 13 acre state vineyard and we ended up picking that vineyard 60 different times. I think that's a um, in an in an ideal growing season, you have that opportunity just to do those my, those carves and finding what's ready when it's ready and and hauling that in. Yeah, and yeah. you came back in the like at the very end of the growing season, right before harvest. So, what was that? All right, just in the beginning of yeah, it was it was just in the beginning of August, and it just felt it felt really natural. Honestly, it just felt like it was almost meant to be, and I just I remembered the vineyard and it just I it just fell into step and fell into place and it was just like I said just very natural feeling and I didn't really think about it it was just all right let's let's do this and I was excited and yeah it just felt really great it's a it's great to look back on it and it's it's great to just see the label on there and have it have it be a finished product it's it's always in enthralling concept in a way. Well, I mean, it's a fascinating arc that you've painted for us. And uh, obviously, you know, with a lot of years in between, but it's really fascinating to taste the very early era wines and then the wines that, the wine that you made, uh, first vintage, 18. It's good to have a good vintage to start with. Right? Yeah. <laughs> and that Excellent. helps, certainly. Well, you know, we have a ton of questions and I think this is always really fun um, when we have, um, you know, a lot of interactivity. And KK, there's a couple of questions about the Cabernet Franc, which is a, a new wine that you've made just a couple of, of barrels of, you know, and, and I've got to just say, you know, one of my great pleasures is being able to go and visit all of these wineries. Um, but like behind the scenes, I mean, you know, uh, it's fun to taste wines at Dalavale when they're like must, they're like still sweet. And it's like, you have the patience, Maya, to say, here, taste this, taste this, taste this. But there are, you know, they're just nascent wines. They're embryonic. They're not formed. At KK, at your place, it's like, you know, you're barrel by barrel, all of these different things. And so that Cabernet Franc is a wine that we've actually tasted directly from the barrel. And as I recall, it wasn't a lot of it, like maybe two barrels. And the last time I was there, you weren't even sure it was going to be commercially released. So I guess it has been sold. At least there's a few people on this call who bought it. So that's good. <laughs> but um what was the, what drove the decision to make that wine is the first, is, is one question. And I'll give you the other one. I don't want to, uh, tell us the first one. What, what was the, what drove you to want to make that wine, to bottle it? Sure. Well, the Cabernet Franc here was planted in 2007. So there were young vines for 
a long time. And it was always just kept separate. And as those vines aged, we start to recognize how distinctive it was. And then in 2016, it was uh, Bettina's call. I, I really didn't have anything to do with it. Just it merited a, a selective bottling. And you've tasted the subsequent vintages out of barrel. And it is, it is unique. It is, when you taste it, it's just, yeah, it's, it makes you think. It does make you think of continuing, continuing to do a separate bottling. So the 2016 was bottled separately. We haven't done a 17, we did not do an 18 separate bottling, but we're seriously considering doing a, a Cabernet Franc for the 19, but I shouldn't say that. It's still too early, we'll see. Okay, is it 100% Franc? Yes. Okay, so that's pretty rare because yeah. there's not, I mean, there's a little bit more of these now, right now, but um, it's a pretty new phenomenon. Usually it's, it's blended more like, like Maya's wine, uh, as opposed right. to, you know, but this, I mean, I just noticed this year there's a bevy of pure Cabernet Francs uh, from throughout the valley. How, what do you think? There's a second question on that wine before we we uh, move on to a few other topics. But what do you think the the age worthiness of, uh, is of that wine? When would you open it? That's a great question. It's we have so few bottles of it. It's another one that I have not tried very much. Again, my hand wasn't really in that in that wine, but. And going forward, it's an interesting point, having a little bit of Cabernet Sauvignon or something to blend with Cab Franc. I think that's sometimes a, a really nice pairing. They, they're friends, they just, are, they work well together. Yeah. But I, I think there's great longevity in that wine. There's a lot of tannin that can really carry it through, through the years. Well, I can tell you whoever bought it, it's very lucky that tasting that wine from barrel, it was really just uh, spectacular. Um, so I'm glad that you, that other people get to buy it. <laughs> um, exactly. I wanted to ask Corey a question because you chose a vintage that you termed as being a difficult vintage, 1993. Obviously that's, this was before your time, but, but I'm curious, it's a question that's, that's on our, on our Q and A here. Is there an extra satisfaction from a wine when you've had a challenging vintage and then you go back years later and you taste that wine, is there an extra bit of satisfaction? When you taste the wine that's come from a hard year, how, what, what does that feel like? That's a great, that's like a really great question. Um, there's definitely something, there's something that, there's an emotional connection, I think more than anything where it means something more to you. And I think sometimes uh, there are vintages where you hope that it means more to everyone else as well, but it's not always the case. Um, but yeah, I think that, you know, we've had some challenging years in the in the past few years, and and I think it really sharpens the team. It brings us together. It it causes us to really ask ourselves what we're you know why are we doing what we're doing, and really just harnesses that energy in a in a special way. And you know, though it's kind of preposterous to put like a hard vintage like that, you know, next to some of like you know, the things that I think about of like 1945 Mouton or something like that. It's like, there's a historical context and 45 is a historical context, truly. And for us years like 17 or 2020, where really as a community, I feel like we were put to a test. It's, uh, there are things you won't, you won't forget. And so when you taste them, they're more than just what's in the glass. They're really everything that surrounded that vintage. And so I guess in a way, it's not that they're, you look at them and you're like, they're clearly better, but it's, it's that they have this uh, additional emotional context. Yeah, no, it's true. Uh, we've got a lot of questions here. We're going to try to get to as many as we can. I mean, it's fantastic. There's over 300 people on this call. So uh, I'm going to do my best to get to as many questions as possible. But Corey, I wanted to share one story, which is about four or five years ago, we had this tasting at Bond of every Bond wine that had been bottled. And, and we tasted them by vineyard. So, you know, all of the St. Edens, all of the Vecinas, all of the Pluribus, et cetera, vineyard by vineyard. And the 2011s were fantastic for eat all five wines. And I personally liked the 11s better than some of the more famous vintages that surrounded them, most notably 2012, which I was never a huge fan of. So, I mean, it's obviously, it's a really good vintage. It's not, I mean, you'd kill to have a vintage like that, but just to say, in this rarefied 
stratosphere where like everything is like searching for perfection. But you know, those 11s uh, come to mind as, I mean, it must be pretty amazing to have tasted those wines, you know, those 14 or 15 years later and they had, they had all held up really well and they showed really well in those verticals. I mean, it's not like if you had tasted those blind, you wouldn't have gotten to that vintage and said, oh, there's the weak vintage. You know, you just wouldn't have, there was this continuity. And so uh, I think it was, was one theme that makes me think about these wines from challenge, you know, more challenging vintages. So one more question for you, Corey, uh, which I've always wondered is, I mean, okay, there's Harlan Estate, which is a single, a wine from a single place. There's Bond, which is exactly, it was like five single vineyards, so almost like a Burgundian concept of wines of single place. Now there's Promontory, which is more like Harlan Estate model, it's wines from a single place. So there's a question about, but it's great, but it's a question from somebody else, but I wanna know too, how do you balance your time between all these places? <laughs> Yeah, so I'm glad it wasn't the hardest question to answer. Um, that one, <laughs> that one's really actually, you know, I think when I first took this on uh, working for Bob, I mean, he was clearly doing everything. And so naturally, I thought I would follow and do the same. Um, but I think really, we've come to the realization that we need to have a dedicated person at each one that really lives and breathes and oozes kind of <laughs> each, uh, each individual um, uh, endeavor because they're all really unique and, and they deserve that and so as much as they're all my children I feel like I'm slowly kind of you know you know David Chile at Promontory is kind of the first success story in that but just really my, my analogy is that you know Promontory is my daughter and she married this Italian guy who's now the most important man <laughs> in her life so um, you know I think for me, the excitement passes on and in, in really what they're able to accomplish with that dedication that's so inspiring for me. So I, I manage it <laughs> as best I can. And I feel like they're all like my children, but really we're moving towards what I talked about. I think it's really the best in the long run. And, and so, you know, one of the, so among you three, my IU grew up, with wine, did you always know that this was what you wanted to do, or was there some sort of moment where it just clicked and you said, "This is what I want to do"? What, what was your path to taking over your family's domain? I mean, you're criminally young, so it's great, but how did that happen? <laughs> um, it took me leaving Napa Valley to realize that's what I wanted to do. I am. It's like when you're surrounded by too much of a good thing, it's like it's too good to be true. This can't be possibly what I want to do. So I, when I went to University of Washington in Seattle, which is a very different uh, climate, let's say, than here, I started realizing um, the sen sentimental value of that of this place. And you know, I'm an only child. I grew up on this property. My parents started together. My father passed away. This is like really a tie for me to him and my mom. And so. I thought, and I also graduated during the recession. So what do you do during the recession? You go work harvest. So I worked harvest um, at another winery, Nyers Vineyards in 09. And then I was like, I was totally hooked after that. That was, that was the aha moment for me. And then that kind of like, was like the domino effect of, of getting the path to, to come back here, which my mom made sure that I was um, qualified enough before coming back. Because you worked at some pretty cool places. I mean, you mentioned Ornelia, but what was it like working at Chateau Latour? It was incredible. Um, I worked both in the on the left and the right bank of Bordeaux at Petrus and Latour, and it was very different experience. Oh, that other place, yeah. The other, the other small chateau. A little small winery <laughs> you, you may have heard of. Bit of driven by because nobody can get in so you've only driven by yeah I, it was fun seeing all the people drive by trying to get into Patrice. <laughs> um but i mean it's just incredible seeing you know globally what people do at the highest um skill level you know just the highest level of farming the highest level of winemaking and you know what what is what are the components that it takes to to get there and it was both experiences were incredibly eye-opening to me and then particularly at Latour was my first um foray into biodynamic farming which is what I brought back here um and got everyone on board 
to go along with me and start farming biodynamically in 18. So is that certified or it will be in three years, I guess, right? Uh, yeah, we have to do the certification for organic first. So we are working on getting the certification this year. We've been organic since 2007, but uh, finally we decided to, to pull the trigger and do the, make it official um, just to, to hold us accountable and to show people, you know, we actually really are farming organically and then kind of move from there for the Demeter certification. Yeah, I mean, obviously it all starts in the vineyard. Yes, And very important. It's easy to forget. So I'm glad you mentioned that because you all have meticulously farmed vineyards, which is pretty evident, you know, when you drive by uh, and, and uh, check out these properties um, that it really all starts there. Um, I'm curious, KK, because you also, whereas Harlan Estate is obviously an estate property and Dalavala is an estate property, but you also get to, you also buy David Avery fruit for your Patino wine. So what, is there a lot of exchange of, of opinions and like, what, are, what do you see in the other sites that you work with? What have you learned from those, those different vineyards? That's one of the questions. So don't, don't it's not my <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Antonio. No, it's, it's such a joy. It's such a gift to work with those, with those vineyards, Madrona, Dorvilos in the past and, and Las Posadas up on Howell Mountain. And while we have the 13 acres here, it's, I mean, it's just such a different exposure, different terroir pieces of ground. And it really does, it's very invigorating and the Bettina blend. So we, we pick those different vineyards separately. Sometimes there's a little bit of co-fermentation that, that happens. And it's just such a different wine than, than the Bryant. The Patina tends to be just a little bit bolder, a little bit more masculine. I would say that the 18 is actually a little bit more on the perfumed and, and floral pretty side. But I think it's nice to have different contexts, just something to compare your vineyard with what's going on during that growing season and just to walk through different rows and just to have some sort of comparison rather than just being, um, just looking at the little 13 acres that, that we have here. Yeah, no, I mean, that's, that's great. That's amazing. I, I mean, I think I tasted that wine from its first vintage, you know, so right. it's been pretty cool. To watch. Right, um, right. But this is a really great question that I wanna ask each of you because I think it's really important. We have so many people watching so many people look up to you and you know one of the questions is you know what are the opportunities like for young winemakers in napa valley right now corey let's start with you what what do you think it's like for somebody who just want who wants to get started um in the sense of is there a, are there opportunities for people yeah i mean i think so i think that um, there's been obviously a tremendous interest in Napa in the last couple decades, and we've seen, as you say, a proliferation of people really dedicated to producing great wines. So I think in that sense, there is quite a bit of opportunity. Um, you know, for us specifically, <laughs> there's been a bit of opportunity for people to be able to kind of grow through the ranks from kind of coming in and, and really our preferences to allow people to come in homegrown and and spend time here and ultimately move up uh, into that position. So I think there's still plenty of opportunity. Yeah, I mean, I think that's, I mean, one of the things that I think is pretty cool is the way that, um, you know, for example, you mentioned Promontory and I mean, you're there when I go taste, but you and Will are there when I go taste, but it's really David's, David's show, you know, and I think that that's uh, great to see, you know, sort of putting somebody young in charge and letting them run with it. I mean, I think, I think this is one of the things that makes Napa Valley very, you know, quite unique in the world that you, if you travel around the world, you do not see young people running top level properties like you do in Napa Valley. You just don't. And I, and I think it's, it's uh, an amazing thing about California in general, but you really see it in Napa Valley, young people really given the reins to run these places and, uh, uh, you just don't see that in, 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 especially in Europe, unless you're super connected, you know, uh, but 
there's a, there is something about American values of meritocracy, and you really see it a lot in Napa Valley. It's one of the things that I, I got to tell you, it really inspires me too, because I see people who are my peers or, or younger doing amazing things, and it's really pretty inspiring. So Maya, what's your view? What What is the landscape like for young winemakers in Napa Valley right now? I think um, there's a lot of opportunities and a lot of um, different networks uh, that are working to try to get more young people to Napa Valley. So we are involved with two different organizations, um, one being the Roots Fund, which is to bring, you know, BIPOC people into Napa Valley and to help make Napa Valley a more diverse and inclusive place. And then I also work with Batonage uh, Women's Mentorship Forum. So I work as a in their men, met one of their mentors, and so it's to help, you know, talk to women who on different levels, you know, maybe just interested in joining the wine industry or who already are in some facet of the wine industry and want to further their career, and helping them give advice and bringing them into the network of people to help you know get them job placements and opportunities and help them grow within the industry so i think it's a really exciting time and um there's a lot of different opportunities for for everyone to be part of it so i think it's great okay kk you're probably the person in the highest position with the shortest tenure which is great <laughs> and so how did you do it i mean what what I mean, if you're a young winemaker, you should just follow what, everything you've done. So how people, how, how did you do it? What, what should a young winemaker be looking at? Well, I, I would say just work really hard. I grew up in Northeastern Ohio, more cornfields than vineyards. And I went to school and I was in the ag school and I started I took a class called From Vines to Wines. My advisor said, oh, you should take this class. I think you'd like it. And I loved it. And I worked in vineyards. I drove a tractor for one season. I just felt like I really had to dive into it to really understand it. And it's funny, I just confirmed it on my phone before this call. My parents at one point said, you know, you should probably talk to somebody that's in the wine world. And I just Googled people and one of them was Doug Schaefer. And I don't, know if Doug is still, <laughs> I, I don't know if Doug is still listening to this. I've never introduced myself or followed up, but he was one of the people that emailed me back and we had a phone conversation. It was in 2008. And he was just so nice and so informative and knowledgeable. And I thought to myself, like, yeah, I could. I'd never been to Napa before. And I thought, I, you know, maybe after graduation, I'll. I'll make my way over there. I didn't know anybody. It was just, yeah. So thank you, Doug. And I got out here in 2010 and I started working internships and what a lot of people like us do is travel around and follow the harvest. And I went to different wine regions. I got to go to Burgundy and Champagne and work in Corsica and Australia and go down to Chile. And I just, I loved it. I loved working towards something that you can, that's a physical manifestation of something, just something you can have your hands on and, and drink with people. And then I ended up interning at Brian in 2012 and just uh, stuck around. And yeah, it's, I think there are opportunities. I think you just have to keep your head up, um, keep working, keep focused. and. If you work it, things will pop up. Well, that's a really inspiring story, and there's no shortcuts, right? But hard work no shortcuts. Usually, usually, usually takes you in the right direction. Um, I'm curious, just because it's such a big theme of everything that we do, sort of all, all around the world, is is the impact of climate change. So, Maya, what what does that mean for your vineyard? What what are you doing? What can you do? what are you thinking about in terms of mitigating the the impact of climate change to viticulture and then of course making wine yeah definitely um it's obvious the climate every year becomes more and more extreme there's trends that you know hot is getting hotter and cold days are getting colder and it does particularly in our site it's something that we're very aware of um because you know when it's 115 degrees, it is quite hot in the vineyard and we're, you know, full exposure in the sun. So we started, you know, 
really implementing different practices in the vineyards, um, like misting systems we have put in for several years now that help cool the temperature of the canopy and give the vines a little bit of relief in those peak heat days, um, implementing shade cloth on the hillside blocks. And that has been really um, instrumental in preventing things like sunburn. And just, um, I mean, we're, we're fortunate we, in California, we can irrigate, but we do it mindfully. We're measuring, you know, the stress level of the vines through pressure bombs weekly and being able to really gauge um, how much water is needed, soil moisture probes, you know, weather station, starting to really dial in on weather patterns and just constantly reading and doing research and keeping ourselves informed about um, different technologies and weather trends and you know what to expect. Um, I know people ask me if we would change the varieties on the property. I really think Cabernet is very resilient and can survive in a number of different climates and is probably like the most durable of any grape variety that I've worked with in terms of stress. So. I wouldn't go so far and I don't have the luxury to just, you know, take part of my vineyard and make an experimental vineyard. I only have 20 acres. So uh, it's just about being mindful and being thoughtful about what we have and then how to protect that moving forward. Okay. Corey, what about, I mean, you have a lot of different kinds of properties that you're looking after. So what's, what's your strategy? Yeah, it's, you know, obviously, a lot of credit, Mary Marr, who a lot of people know, who's worked in the vineyard for a long time, as well as Julia Vanderbank, who's been doing a lot of the, really heading up the R&D for, for the domain and for the family. It's really been a lot of focus on getting to dry farming, which sounds ironic based on all of the things that <laughs> we're up against. It seems like conditions are getting more and more difficult, yet I think if all of us were asked the question, what's been the evolution of the wines produced in the last 10 years, they've been fresher and fresher and more vibrant. And so how is that possible? Um, you know, I really, you know, 2020 was probably the lowest rainfall we've ever received, yet we dry farmed a higher percentage of our vineyard. And so I think that the plants are able to adapt on a level, they're very well suited to adapt through things. I think the harder part is for us to adapt um, we still feel like things should be harvested on the same calendar days and the same time period, the same phenological stages. And, and so we need to, we need to kind of track with that. We need to be open to it. I think this year I saw the senescence of the basil leaves, dry farming being more matched to like the buckeye trees and the surrounding environment. That's what a native environment would do given a low rainfall year and early stress signals. It, it hastens maturity and, and we have to respond and not just say, well, we've always picked at this date, so now we need to just wait for it. And I, anyway, maybe I'm speaking just for myself. I, I found that I'm more of the challenge in evolving with what's happening out there than, than the plants themselves, so. Well, that's a pretty self-aware question. I mean, mother nature, I mean, answer, I should say. Mother Nature does have her own rhythms and doesn't really care about a lot of, you know, yeah, about the, about the human side of it so much. I mean, the vines are going to do what they're going to do. KK, for you, what's the, what are you doing? Just in the short, in the immediate term, we're surveying our property and thinking about introducing goats and just hard solutions. So having goats to then eat some of the brush and diminish the, the potential fuel for fires. And just in the everyday farming, again, you know, to Maya's and Corey's point, just being very aware of our irrigation strategies and really pushing the dry farming. And I think when you're really in tune, especially if you, you feel threatened, like if we run out of water or we're looking at a heat spike, you really, it forces you to be more proactive and maybe we are doing more some of the, the biodynamic sprays that help with vitality that help increase and boom the microbial life in the soils and being ahead of our irrigations, monitoring vine 
water stress by doing pressure bombs and doing just constant visual cues. We definitely have our finger on the pulse. We're not looking at any overarching, really grand changes, planting different varieties, things of that nature, but just being very in tune and responding and being proactive. Yeah. And, you know, I think the big takeaway from that is that notwithstanding all the challenges that, well, I don't, I don't think so. I can't say we, because I'm not you, but I'm not making wine, but notwithstanding all the challenges that you face in farming and making wine in a world that is increasing, where climate change is increasingly uh, playing a very important role, it's also pretty obvious to me as an outsider looking in that the focus on sustainability has never been higher than it is now. And that's a plus. So um, there's actually an opportunity here to, I think, take the current situation, and actually turn it into, into a positive. Um, so uh, I want to just take a minute uh, and just go over these, these, uh, these lots that you've each contributed because there's a lot of questions about you know, fires and this and the future of Napa Valley and all sorts of the, you know, these themes that could take up a three hour conversation very easily that we just don't have time to get to. But one of the things, if you're, if you're worried about that and you should be, uh, you know, you can bid very generously on these, on these auction lots. And I just want to go over what's in some of these because these are really amazing collections. So from Harlan Estate, there's the hundred point collection. It's five magnums, 1.5 liters of 97, 01, 02, 07, and 13. You know, those are very famous vintages, obviously. From Bryan Estate, there's 10 years of true terroir. That's 05 to 14, 10 magnums. Uh, so you know, 10 1.5 liter bottles, one from each vintage. And then from Dalla Valle, there's the Lucky 7 collection, which is uh, six vintages of the, of the Maya, uh, 10 through 2015, plus a magnum of the MDV. So that's very, very cool. And of course, the Harlan family has also contributed a five vintage vertical from Bond, 99, Melbury, 99, Vecina, 01, St. Eden, 03, Pluribus, and 06, Quella. So that's one vintage of each of the five uh, vintages in the Bond portfolio. And then five, six vintages, sorry, of Promontory, 09 through 2014. So that's the very beginning to current. So a super cool way to see how that's evolved. Um, bidding has just opened, so please be generous if you can. I'd like to just take a moment to thank our three panelists, Corey Emting, Maya Dalavale, and KK Carruthers. It's been an absolute pleasure. It's extremely fun to be able to talk about wine when there's not some sort of other appointment or schedule afterwards. Thank you for sharing these beautiful wines. Um, I'd like to thank everybody at the Napa Valley Vintners for organi organizing and hosting the Napa Valley sessions, the Zackies for running the auction, and again, the 300 or so participants that we had on this call, your fabulous questions. Please tune in for the next session, which is tomorrow at 12 p.m. Pacific. We'll be talking about Oakville and all sorts of detail. Thanks, everyone. Have a great evening, and thanks so much for your time. Cheers. Thank, Thank you. you.